Okay, welcome back. We are on Chapter 5 of Battlefield of the Mind, Winning the Battle in Your Mind. And thanks for joining today. And let's just pray before we get started. Thank you so very, very much, God, that you work all things out for our good, that you are for us, you're not against us. And God, thank you that you are in control of every situation. And God, uh, we open our hearts and our minds to you to learn anything and everything you would have us learn today. And thank you so very much, God, for having Jesus pay the price that he did for our sins, that we can be set free. And it is because of his blood and his blood alone that we can be set free. And just thank you so much, God, for this Joyce Meyer um, lady that is just incredible that's made this book and many other books. But just thank you, God, for the ability that we are able to renew our minds. Like Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, help us to actually truly renew our mind the way you want it renewed so we can truly live life to the fullest. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do in our lives. Um, and um, thank you, God, for the healing and the freedom that's going to come from continuing to win the battle in our mind. Okay. So we're going to do chapter five. And it is chapter five is be positive. And if you need the page number, it's on page 37. And just so you know, the book that I'm um, actually reading from is, whoops, this one here. And it is Battlefield of the Mind. Okay, the um, updated edition. Okay. Okay. Matthew 8, verse 13. It shall be done for you as you have believed. Positive minds produce positive lives. Negative minds produce negative lives. Positive thoughts are always full of faith and hope. Negative thoughts are always, are always full of fear and doubt. Some people are afraid to hope because they have been hurt so much in life. They have had so many disappointments. They don't think they can face the pain of, an, of another one. Therefore, they refuse to hope so they won't be disappointed. This avoidance of hope is a type of protection against being hurt. Disappointment hurts. So rather than be hurt again, many people simply refuse to hope or believe that anything good will ever happen to them. This type of behavior sets up a negative lifestyle. Everything becomes negative because the thoughts are negative. Remember Proverbs, verse, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Many years ago, I was extremely negative. I always say that if I thought two positive thoughts in a row my mind would get in a cramp. My whole philosophy was this. If you don't expect anything good to happen, then you won't be disappointed when it doesn't. I had encountered so many disappointments in life, so many devastating things that had happened to me, that I was afraid to believe that anything good might happen. I had a terribly negative outlook on everything. Since my thoughts were all negative, so was my mouth. Therefore, so was my life. When I really began to study the Word and trust God to restore me, one of the first things I realized was that negativism had to go. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 13, Jesus tells us that it will be done for us as we have believed. The King James Version says, As thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Everything I believed was negative. So naturally, many negative things happen to me. This doesn't mean that you and I can get anything we want by just thinking about it. God has a perfect plan for each of us, and we can't control him with our thoughts and words. But we must think and speak in agreement with his will and plan for us. If you don't have any idea what God's will is for you at this point, at least begin by thinking, well... I don't know God's plan, but I know He loves me. Whatever He does will be good, and I'll be blessed. Begin to think positively about your life. Practice being positive in each situation that arises, even if whatever takes place in your life at that moment is not so good. Expect God to bring good out of it, as His Word, as He has promised in His Word. 
All things work for good. We are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitted into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to His design and purpose. Romans 8.28 The scripture does not say that all things are good, but it does say that all things work together for good. Let's say you're planning to go shopping. You get in the car and you won't start. There's two ways you can look at this situation. You can say, I knew it. It never fails. Every time I want to do something, it gets all messed up. I figured the shopping trip would end up a flop. My plans always do. Or you can say, well, I wanted to go shopping, but it looks like I can't go right now. I'll go later when the car is fixed. In the meantime, I believe this change of plans is going to work out for my good. There's probably some reason I need to be at home today. So I'm going to enjoy my time there. In Romans chapter 12, verse 16, the Apostle Paul tells us to readily adjust ourselves to people and things. Mm. The idea is that we must learn to become the kind of person who plans things, but who doesn't fall apart if that plan doesn't work out. Recently, I had an excellent opportunity to practice this principle. Dave and I were in Lake Worth, Florida. We had been ministering for there for three days and we were packing and getting ready to go to the airport to go home. I had planned to wear slacks and a blouse with flat shoes so I could be comfortable during the return trip. I started getting dressed and couldn't find my slacks. We looked all over the place and finally found them in the bottom of the closet. They had slipped off the hanger and were terribly wrinkled. We take a portable clothes steamer with us, and I tried to steam out the wrinkles, but I put on the outfit and I saw that it was just not going to look right. My only other choice was a dress and high heels. I could feel my emotions getting upset with the situation. You see, any time we don't get what we want, our feelings will rise up and try to get us into self-pity and a negative attitude. I recognized immediately that I had a choice to make. I could be irritable because things hadn't worked out the way I wanted them to, or I could adjust myself to the situation and go ahead and enjoy the trip home. Even a person who is really positive won't have everything work out the way he would like it to all the time, but the positive person can go ahead and decide to enjoy himself no matter what happens. The negative person never enjoys anything. A negative person is no fun to be with. He brings a gloomy overcast to every project. There's a heaviness about him. He is a complainer, a, a complainer, a murmurer, and a fault finder. No matter how many good things are going on, he always seems to spot the one thing that could be a potential problem. When I was in my days of extreme negativism, I could walk into someone's home that had been newly decorated and rather than seeing and commenting on all the lovely surroundings, I would spot a corner of wallpaper that was loose or a smudge on the window. I'm so glad Jesus has set me free to enjoy the good things in life. I am free to believe that with faith and hope in Him, the bad things can be turned around for good. If you are a negative person, don't feel condemned. Condemnation is negative. I'm sharing these things so you can recognize your problem with with being negative and begin to trust God to restore you, not to get you become negative about your negativism. The pathway to freedom begins when we face the problem without making excuses for it. I'm sure that if you are a negative person, there's a reason for it. There always is. But remember, as a Christian, according to the Bible, you are a new person now.